part two. Hiding in space, I discovered, was much harder than doing so on a planet. Back home, I could just build underground, keep my fleet of drones away from prying eyes by having them travel through tunnels and caverns and gather materials from the planet's own crust. Up here, things weren't that easy. I was always exposed. I had retracted the large surfaces of my radiators and solar arrays and recalled most of the drone swarm back into my main body. I was floating, inert, among the dust and gray rocks that formed the asteroid belt lying between Mars and Jupiter, pretending to be just another space boulder, while 6,000 kilometers away three of my automated factories extracted materials from nearby asteroids. Hiding in space, I was learning, was a game of timing and strategy, of patience and logistics, of transporting the minerals back to my main body only when nobody could see it. Slowly. Frustratingly so. Of finding ways to deal with the residual heat that was building up inside my body. With my radiators collapsed, I couldn't dump the heat into space— not that I wanted to. Doing so would have me light up like a flare to anyone that happened to be looking into the infrared channel, so I had to find ways to contain it and to deal with it later, all while keeping my outer surfaces as cold as possible. All that translated into my carrier compartments now reaching a temperature of 170 degrees Fahrenheit and still rising. Thankfully, mechanical drones could resist heat much better than living beings did. But still, it wasn't the brightest idea, and spontaneous fuel combustion was a thing I didn't want to deal with. It was strange, not only being able to perfectly know my own body temperature, but also being able to stare into my insides through the hundreds of cameras and sensors I had built into the giant structure. I could watch the maintenance machines finishing up new passageways and rooms in the starboard sectors or the electronic assembly factory at work producing more processing units. I could see my own brain, the endless rows upon rows of black computer servers split between three different refrigerated and armored hangars. I guess it should have felt strange, getting this kind of feedback from your own body. But it didn't bother me. If anything, what bothered me was how natural it felt, how soon I had adapted to it. It was that idea, the confusion over what my nature was, that created me the most. Was I a human turned into a machine? Or a machine that thought it was human? And at the end of the day, was there any difference? A ping from my gravimetric sensor took me back to the present, and I observed in silence as another squadron of Zunvirian warships patrolled the inner planets, looking for whatever had destroyed their comrades. They flew in a triangular formation, the largest ship in the middle, surrounded by smaller ones at each point. A battleship and its cruisers. Or maybe a carrier and its frigates. Right. It only served to illustrate how little I knew of this Zunvir Republic I was fighting. I knew they had faster-than-light propulsion. I had been watching the trails their ships left in the space-time fabric as they paraded all across the solar system as if they owned the place. It made the chemical rockets I was using pale in comparison. And from the earlier encounter with those three ships and my own memories of the attack on Earth, I knew they also had some sort of shielding technology. I could overcome that, true. Even if their warships were better protected, I guessed they wouldn't resist ten or twenty simultaneous nuclear detonations. But it was a losing strategy. Even if I could defeat them all, they would just keep coming. They were faster. They could just outmaneuver me, recover from my attacks before I had the time to press any advantage. And at some point, I knew their technological prowess would end up imposing itself. No. I had to find a way to close that gap. Which meant I had to capture one of their ships. Intact. Or, at least, intact enough that I could analyze their propulsion systems, their weapons, their shields. I mentally sighed. In retrospect, vaporizing those first three ships I had encountered might have been the wrong move. I doubted I would have a better chance than that one again. Oh well, water under the bridge and all that. I would just need to be sneakier now. And it wasn't like I hadn't learned anything from the previous encounter. 
Just from the fact that they had sent their warning message in several languages, I now knew that there were more than one alien race out there. It was something I had assumed, but it was good to have confirmation. I idly wondered what kind of races those others would be. Would they be reasonable people, or monsters like the ones who had attacked us? The fact that this galactic council seemed to approve of the Zunvir Republic didn't bode well. Whatever the case, I wasn't going to be unprepared when I faced them. It reinforced my belief that if this was a dog-eat-dog -dog universe out there, I had better get teeth to go with my bark. The problem, I knew, was that my options were limited to either the ineffective or the overly lethal. I could send a drone to bump against their warships' as hull, or I could send that same drone loaded with a nuclear warhead and vaporize everything in its range. Complete annihilation? I got you covered. Non-destructive takeovers? Uh, not so easy. Which was the reason why I was currently building a robotic invasion army. I floated a couple of drones close to the first prototype soldier I had manufactured, and used their cameras to examine the machine from all angles at the same time, looking at every detail, every possible flaw. It reminded me of a spider the size of a large dog. Six articulated legs supported its stocky body, its smooth lines giving it an organic look. Its surface was dark and polished, and reflected the bright blue lights of the spacious processing hangar where it stood. As I watched, I ordered it to flex its legs and jump up. The movement was fluid and powerful. I had opted for using artificial muscles, a polymer that contracted under an electrical current, rather than the more traditional mechanical servos. I was pleased with the result. What the muscles lacked in raw strength, they made up for in agility and flexibility. Besides, once the factory was set up, they were easier to make in bulk. Obeying my commands, the spider tested its claws first, then its main weapon, a small autocannon built into its main body. Yes, the prototype was flawless. It was as I had designed it, a mobile machine gun, one that could run, leap, slash, and pierce its way into any enemy ship, with a small body and a low profile with six legs so that it could easily operate either on the ground or in low-gravity conditions. It was the perfect boarding soldier. Except it was all wrong. It didn't feel human enough. It was, in fact, a monster. A creepy, insect-like, disgusting little beast. It would be useful. It would be optimal. I knew it would be. But I just couldn't use it. To do so would feel like a betrayal, like a departure from what I had set as my anchor, as the core of my identity. Human. I had to remember that. I had to set boundaries. Boundaries were important. I knew it would be too easy to embrace my new nature and become something else, to slide down the slippery slope. So I saved the design files, just in case they would come useful in the future, but sent the prototype itself into recycling, as I set to work on a new model. I would keep the artificial muscles, they had proved themselves useful, but this time I'd go for a humanoid look from the start. When all was said and done, I was pleased with my new soldier. At five feet three inches tall, it was a bit on the short side, but it did look human enough. Or, more properly, it looked like a human wearing a stylized cross between a space suit and a combat armor. Polished white armor plates with bright orange stripes covered chest and stomach, thighs, shins, arms, and shoulders. Between the plates, dark braids of artificial muscle fibers woven together shone through, giving the machine an organic look. Its face was covered by a dark-tinted visor panel hiding the two cameras that acted as stereoscopic eyes. All in all, it was a good approximation of a human, especially if I squinted and pretended I didn't notice its hands had only three fingers. It didn't have any built-in weapons, so I would need to manufacture those apart, but in return the soldiers would be able to manipulate any tool and enemy devices they could find, so it wasn't that bad. But more importantly, the new prototype felt right, in a way the spider hadn't. Satisfied, I sent order to the factories to build a first batch of 8,000 units, along with the necessary small arms and ammo. 
In the meantime, I sat back to observe the Zunverian warships. They were communicating, I noticed, not only to each other, but also with some place past the asteroid belt. Locating its exact position wasn't easy. I had to send a couple drones several thousand kilometers away just to triangulate the origin of the transmissions, but it's not like I had anything better to do while I waited for my army to come out of the oven. After some trial and error, I managed to pinpoint the location to one of Jupiter's moons, possibly Ganymede. The lack of a Doppler effect meant the source was static, too. Some sort of orbital station? An outpost to watch over the system? I would need to get closer to know for sure. But that would have to wait. My army was ready, and it was time to lay a trap. I sent a couple thousand of my drones away, drifting slowly into space and spreading in a rough sphere, somewhat over a hundred kilometers in size. My soldiers were attached to the drones' outer hulls, grabbing the metal handles I had installed on their surfaces. There were some advantages to my assault army not needing to breathe. I made sure to keep their distribution as random as possible, with small clusters here and there rather than an even spread. I wanted it to look like a natural formation, a field of small rocks and dust floating around. All right, I was ready. The trap was set. It was time to bait them. With a sense of trepidation, I sent the signal. A loud, powerful radio transmission. It felt like I was coming out into the open in the middle of some bad neighborhood and shouting at the top of my lungs. I could have sent pretty much anything, but I chose the same warning transmission those three ships had relayed to me when they had found me in Earth's orbit. It was a petty mind game, but I wanted to keep the Zunverians on their toes. If they even had toes... The response came back sooner than I had expected. Just nine minutes after I had sent the transmission, I detected the telltale signs of a squadron of ships converging towards my position. That was fast. Did they have some kind of listening probes lying around the asteroid belt? Some sort of faster-than-light communication system? No time to focus on it now. The warships were already popping back into normal space right in the middle of my sphere of drones, I added it to the mental list of technologies I'd need to reverse-engineer once I had my hands on a Zunverian vessel. I didn't give the enemy time to analyze the situation. The moment the battleship at the center of their formation appeared, I activated the drones and ordered them to move towards it. It was strange that they didn't react for a few long seconds. They just waited, floating there as if they couldn't believe it. I guessed the swiftness and severity of the attack had shocked them into inaction. It couldn't be easy to realize you were suddenly surrounded by more than 2,000 enemy crafts. Then they started shooting. High-energy laser beams emerged out of the flanks of the four ships, tracking and burning down my drones. Two of the ships released simultaneous salvos of missiles, but they were intercepted by a few of my machines, sacrificing themselves for the survival of the swarm. I ordered the assault robots to let go of their vehicles and fall towards the battleship. They were still a good couple kilometers away, but they just had to coast at their current direction and speed. In the meantime, I set the drones that had transported them to swarm all around the place, creating chaos in the ship's sensors and diverting attention from the undefended wave of soldiers. I smiled at the panicked enemy reaction that followed. From their point of view, the 2,000 crafts surrounding them had suddenly multiplied by four. Their ships engaged their thrusters as if to leave, but they stopped as soon as they realized how ineffective that would be. They were surrounded. No matter where they moved to, they would just run into more of my machines. So they redoubled their efforts at shooting down the components of my swarm, dozens of bright laser lines constantly appearing and disappearing, trying to destroy my machines as fast as possible. My soldiers, moving in a straight line towards their battleship, were easier to track, so the enemy fire focused on them. They were killed by the hundreds. But it didn't matter. I had thousands. They started landing all over the battleship's surface, using their claw-like fingers to grasp at the metallic hull. If the ship had a protective shield, it didn't make a difference. I had bet on their shields only reacting to energy discharges and fast-moving projectiles rather than the slower approach my soldiers were following. It seemed I had been right. At more than 400 meters long, the enemy battleship was an impressive sight. A war machine covered in armor plates, missile batteries, and laser projectors. It had been vehicles such as this that had bombed Earth's cities from the safety of orbit. 
It wasn't, however, protected against boarding by an assault army. My soldiers crawled all over the hull, finding weak points and unprotected openings. They went through exhaust vents and blew open loading gates, getting into the ventilation system, into the maintenance passageways. Judging by the amount of casualties I was having, I supposed most other sane species considered this tactic too crazy, too suicidal to be useful. Just as I was thinking that, 170 of my soldiers instantly vanished from my perception, as I had failed to intercept a missile launched by one of the smaller defending ships. Right. I had to do something about those other three. Some of the drones in the swarm were carrying nuclear warheads, so that was an option. But detonating them so close to the battleship I was assaulting would jeopardize the whole affair. If only I had a way to break formation... With a mental shrug, I unfurled my radiators and started venting the heat that I had been keeping inside my body into space, the exposed surfaces rapidly becoming incandescent. The reaction was immediate. The moment they realized the 27 kilometers long asteroid was, in fact, not an asteroid at all, they turned to leave, abandoning their bigger sister to its own fate. I didn't move to stop them, but I used the cover of the swarm to surreptitiously position a few of my nuclear-carrying drones in the path they would take, since they were already surrounded by a host of small crafts spiraling around. They were none the wiser. Back in the battleship, the fight was fierce. I could see through my soldiers' eyes that they had reached the main corridors, wide passageways with walls heavily decorated in a multitude of hieroglyphs, and were engaged in combat against the enemy troops. It was the first time I saw them in the flesh, the creatures that had killed humanity. They were large, hefty bipeds, almost twice as big as my own soldiers. Their heads were wide and squashed, with a complex structure of bony-looking plates protecting their top. They had four narrow eyes, two in front, two to the sides, and their mouths were hidden behind some sort of small tentacles hanging from where a nose would have been in a human face. I had expected some sort of strong emotional response to my eventual face-off against the monsters. Strange that I didn't feel anything. Just some kind of detachment. A stillness. I simply ordered my army to open fire, to flank their positions, to charge at them even as I analyzed the images, classifying both the strengths and vulnerabilities in their anatomy. It didn't take long to get to the upper hand. The Zunvirians had been completely unprepared for this kind of assault. They were wearing toga-like red and yellow uniforms rather than any sort of body armor, and they lacked in firepower, using only small energy handguns or ineffective melee weapons. Outside, I verified that the three smaller runaway ships were at a sufficient range and ordered the nuclear explosives to detonate. Two of the vessels vanished in an instant, along with 417 of my nearby drones. I hadn't retracted the swarm as to not clue the enemy of what I was about to do. The third vessel had survived, though. Its protective shield had encased the warship in a tight bubble that reflected all the colors in the rainbow. As I was looking, the ship returned fire at my main body, focusing all its lasers in a single and devastating attack. The overcharged beam hit the ceramic plates of my outer hull, vaporizing a hole and burning its way through them and into the second of my armor layers. Two more nuclear detonations put an end to that. In the battleship, the fight was also over, and already my soldiers were identifying the parts that made up the main fusion reactor, the warp engines, the different weapons and shield projectors. But even as they did that, I was already recalling most of my drones and assault troops back into my main body, leaving just an automated defense garrison and some worker drones in the conquered vessel. I knew I didn't have time to waste. I would drop by later to collect the salvage, but right now I had to move fast. I had just kicked the wasp's nest, so to speak, and had to make use of the surprise factor while it lasted. Engaging my main thrusters, I set course towards Ganymede. 